The Arthur Godfrey Show, brought to you by Bristol Myers, makers of Ban Lotion Deodorant, Bufferin, the modern pain reliever, and new Ipana toothpaste. Know what we like about Ipana? Know what we like about Ipana? With Ipana, there's not a whisper of bad breath. Not a whisper of bad breath. See, Ipana really works. Use it regularly and prevent bad breath. You know by Ipana's distinct taste. And refreshing aftertaste. Your whole mouth even feels cleaner. Right. A new Ipana with WD-9 has twice the decay germ-killing power of any other leading brand. Just look. It would take this much ordinary toothpaste to give you the germ-killing power you get from... This much Ipana. Ipana helps fight tooth decay. For everybody. Look for the big tap. Only on new Ipana. With Ipana, there's not a whisper of that breath. The Arthur Godfrey Show brought to you by Bristol Myers. And now from Washington National Airport, here's Arthur. Thank you, Tony. Good evening to you, my dear friend. I do speak to you from right underneath the tower, the control tower that you're looking at right there at Washington National Airport. I'm in the famous terrace room where thousands and thousands of airline passengers going in and out through Washington, D.C. National Airport are refreshed and entertained. Through the windows at my back, you can see the activities going on. On this, one of the top three busiest airports in the United States, and I might add, one of the finest facilities for airplanes of all kinds in the whole country. I've had a great deal to do, uh, what shall I say, a great deal of experience in and out of this airport in my 35 years of flying, and I want you to know I've never run into a better managed place uh, where, where the facilities that are available are handled in a better fashion. The, the whole place is, is just a marvel to watch. A little bit later on, you'll see some more of what goes on, but I want to establish that fact first. I chose Washington National Airport because it's one of the top busiest three I think it's number three on the list of busiest airports in America, and it's one of the best run. And uh, on top of that, I know some of the people here over these years, so that's the reason. Now, what I wanted to do tonight was a little different than what we've usually done on Wednesdays. As you know, this is the next to the last of my Wednesday night series. Next week will be the last one. And before I left this wonderful opportunity to talk to you on Wednesday night. I wanted to uh, bring you, if I could, the story of a man who plays a great part in your life if you ever ride in an airplane. And you do if you are one of the 50 million, 50 million Americans will ride in a commercial airliner sometime during 1957. That means one out of every three. Almost one out of every three people. That doesn't mention the military. doesn't take into consideration the privately owned aircraft like my own or the executive aircraft. I'm speaking only of ticket purchasing airline passengers. Fifty million of them. Therefore, aviation and all of its Prod uh, problems is no longer something for a relatively few to worry about like it used to be. It's something for you to consider now. Your safety, your life, your comfort is at stake. Uh, I want you tonight to meet some of the people who are responsible for your safety, for your comfort, for your convenience. Uh, the whole idea of tonight's program is dedicated to the 
if I may use the word, glorification of a man who needs glorifying, the airways traffic controller. Not only the traffic controller himself, but uh, the engineers who handle the equipment that he works with, the radar technicians, the electronics men, the communicators, the radio communicators along the line, those employees of the Civil Aeronautics Authority Administration, the CAA, dedicated, underpaid, wonderful guys who make it possible for you and me to fly where we want to, when we want to, in the safest mode of transportation we know in America today. Now, on the basis of the fact, therefore, that one out of every three people is going to ride in an airplane this year, I feel some confidence in addressing myself to the subject tonight. Now, what I've tried to do while doing everything else that we have to do during the weeks Oh, we've been working on this idea for two or three months. We've made film, we've, we've talked to people, and we've gotten ideas how in the world to present this project to you in first an entertaining manner and an interesting manner as well as informative manner. I hope that we've got something you'll enjoy tonight and maybe get something out of. Because if, we, if you understand, you, Mr. Public, if you understand, things will be a lot better, a lot better. Now, to begin this thing, we thought uh, perhaps the best way would be to show you what goes on in the cockpit of a big airliner. So I asked Pan American World Airways to loan me their simulator in New York, out at Idlewild, Airport, they have a simulator. They have the, the actual nose, the big cockpit of a DC 7C uh, in a room in their building up there, and it's hooked up electronically with various panels in the room, which make it possible for the chief simulator instructor and his colleagues to uh, duplicate, simulate every possible flying condition that this airplane can encounter. Uh, let, let me introduce to you first, if I may, the chief, the, the chief simulator instructor at uh, Idlewild for Pan American World Airways. His name is Tony Parcini. Tony, come over here a minute, will you please, sir? Just want the folks to see you, you handsome fellow. You sit down here a minute. You, you live where? Beth Page, New York. Beth Page, that's Long Island, isn't that's it? Right. And you have uh, children? Three. Three children. Who are they? Well, uh, Joanne, uh, eight, and Bobby, five, and my son, Anthony, ten. That's Tony Jr.? Tony Jr. Tony Jr. He's <laughs> ten years old, huh? Yes. Now, how long have you been in this business? Well, with Pan American, ten years, total of 15 years, all told. In, uh, in, in training pilots? That's right. With in Link? Uh, with Link? Starting with, out with Link With trains. Link, and then to this big simulator. That's right. Uh, this is the last word of... Well, it is, especially since uh, uh, back in 1948 we received delivery from the Curtis Wright Corporation of uh, the Boeing 377 simulator, which was the first simulator, and we pioneered the field. Yeah. And this yeah. is the tops, really. Sir. As you will see, with this simulator that uh, is in Tony's bailiwick, we are able to duplicate every condition that can possibly occur in flight and a whole lot of things that never happen and we hope never will, but Tony throws them at us anyway to be sure. All right, Tony, thank you. Thank it's you. nice to meet you. And I want the folks to know uh, Captain Bill Moss. Captain Bill, come over here, please. Is a Pan American Air World Airways chief uh, training pilot, is that it? The assistant chief pilot in charge of training. The assistant <laughs> chief pilot in charge of training, that's right. You've been with Pan American how long, Bill? Since 1939. 1939. You were, learned to fly where, please, sir? In the Navy. In the Navy? Pensacola? Yes, sir. Got your wings what year? 1936. 1936. Now, uh, as uh, assistant chief in charge of training, what's your job? To take these men through the transition in the simulator? Yes, sir. Basically, I'm responsible for the aircraft handling proficiency of our 700-odd Atlantic Division pilots. 
700 pilots in the Atlantic Division. Do you get to fly the liners yourself now occasionally? Um, yes, sir. I make about a one trip across the pond a month. One uh, Across the Atlantic? Yes, sir. Well, I see. Uh, what are you doing then? Are you actually flying or you are instructing or checking or what? Well, both. I um, try to fly my own trips about 300 hours a year and I get about 200 hours a year of instruction and check flying in addition. I see. I see. Now you'll see Bill a little later in the simulator with me. I wanted you to see him in person first. Thank you. Now I want you to meet the engineer, Dick McBride. Dick, please come over here. You'll see Dick wears three stripes. He's the engineer officer and one of the senior engineers at uh, Pan American. Your job, Dick? Assistant Chief Flight Engineer. Officer. Assistant Chief Flight Engineer. Are you are you got some training too in your work? Yes, we do quite a bit of our training in the simulator. As you'll see in the uh, cockpit, the captain sits on the left, the co-pilot on the right, and the engineer right behind him. That's where Dick's seat is, and he, he will do in this film that we made. He's going to be my engineer to show you how this thing worked. I wanted you to meet him in person. As you can see, they're all nice guys been in the business a long, long time and know what they're doing. Thanks so much, Dick. All right. Now, uh, let me see. The time, oh, Lord, every, t no matter what kind of show we do, the last one I'll do on this earth, I know, I won't have time to do. That's the way it'll be. <laughs> but, uh, let, let me get into this film now. We spent a lot of time with these three lads and cameramen and uh, and our people making this film and then editing it down and trimming it down and then we had to cut it to make sure so here's what you'll see when we go in there uh, I'll be sitting in the captain's seat on the left side with Captain Bill so graciously let me have for the purpose he sits in the right seat and acts as my co-pilot and uh, Dick McBride right behind as the engineer and I explained to you in the film the instruments that we use in flight let's turn it on now please Freddie in New York on with the film. Anyhow, I wanted to show you a little bit about the instruments that Captain Moss and I would use flying this thing. First thing might be of interest. Way up here, you see, way up in the nose of our, in, in, the, in the apex of our cockpit, is an old magnetic compass. Except for the fact that it's in a very modern housing and, and it's got some uh, non-freezing liquid in there. That's the same kind of a thing Columbus used. And that's the thing we rely upon when everything else goes haywire. If, any, if, if it all went to pieces, we'd still go back to old Christopher Columbus's compass to, at our heading. Now, we can't use it too much in flying. We don't use it too much in flying, except when we have to, for the reason that uh, as you turn it, it gets to swinging. And we fly too accurately. Our, our, our flight path is too too precise to, to follow a thing like that. In a ship, what do you care which way it goes? You can take all day long if you like. But in an airplane, you have to fly a precision course. So let's come over here to this instrument panel and let me show you what we use instead. We call this our RMI. RMI, Radio Magnetic Indicator. Right, Bill? Now this thing is, is run by um, gyroscopes and it's electrically connected to a master compass down below and way back in the tail someplace or out on one of the wings. And it shows us not only what our heading is, but it's our magnetic heading. See, this is our magnetic heading. And uh, as, as I, uh, I want to point out to you that it's absolutely possible for us to get on the end of the runway headed down the runway in the right direction and then from that moment on we can fly this thing without ever looking outside that window only on these instruments with the engineer controlling all the engines and the captain checking the uh, the co-pilot checking the captain all the time you see so we're using this radio magnetic indicator rmi for our compass to show us our heading now, supposing we're on the ground and taxiing into position to take off, and let's say that we're going to take off to the northwest on runway 33. Runway 33. That means we're going to head into the wind that's coming from the northwest from 330 degrees. Uh, we're taxiing east 
along the taxi strip now, out to the runway, and it will show on this RMI our, our path along the taxiway. We're going east, you see. Now as we come to the, to the end of the runway, from which point we're going to make our takeoff, we'd have to turn left to get into it. And with this nose wheel, I'm going to turn the plane now to the left. You see the RMI turning as the plane swings around on the ground. And we come over here to where we were lined up perfectly on the runway 33. Now, we get the cue to take off. And all we have to do with this nose wheel is hold this thing right on that on that path. Hold that right there, never looking out anymore. Just hold that right there with the nose wheel. If it started off to the left like this, you come back this way quickly, very, very easily like that, until you had gotten sufficient airspeed indicated on here to start using the rudders. And then you would hold it with that as you gathered speed. Now these instruments, which the pilot and co-pilot use, are really quite simple. First we have a 24-hour clock with a second hand, which we can start and stop when we want to for accurate time. This is our artificial horizon, the artificial horizon with combined with a zero reader, and I'll explain this to you in detail later. This is the RMI we were discussing. This is the airspeed indicator, show us how fast we are going in the air. This is the rate of climb or descent. This shows us how many feet per second, uh, per minute we're climbing or descending. This is called a PDI. This is a new instrument and it's a honey. It's called uh, the PDI, which means the pictorial deviation indicator. I'll show you more about that later. This is the altimeter. How many feet are we in the air? And this is our turn and bank indicator. This is one of the oldest instruments. In the old days, we had this and that old compass I showed you, and that was about it. Now, if I may, I'd like to demonstrate to you this artificial horizon instrument here, which enables us to fly and keep straight and level when we can't see anything for reference, when we're in clouds or over water where it's mist or haze and we can't see the ground or the horizon. Uh, for this purpose, we've got this simulator now flying just as though we were in an airplane uh, 2,000 feet. There's 2,000 feet on my altimeter. I'm indicating 200 knots and uh, I'm flying along here in a, in a southeasterly direction 150 degrees. Now watch this instrument, please. In level flight, this is our little airplane. This is the little airplane. If I want to turn to the right, I bank the right wing down. You see the right wing go down? This now, there's the horizon. That hasn't moved. You see, I've got the right wing way down, and I'm turning to the right. If you look at the compass, you see, I'm swinging around to the right. Now when I want to level the plane back up again, I level those wings off with that horizon there. Now I'm back in level flight. Now all this time, my eyes have been scanning this instrument, this one, the rate of climb, and the altimeter. Notice how if I put the airplane nose down, I'm nosing the airplane down. Immediately I show a loss of altitude here, the altimeter is going down. This shows me how fast I'm descending, that's 500 feet a minute right now. 500 feet a minute there, and if I want to hold it in that, there's a thousand feet a minute, and I get to 1500 feet, level it off, easy, easy, stop the descent by coming back on this yoke. And to climb, you can use the elevated trim if you like, take some of the weight off the pilot's hands. Now the indicator shows five, six, seven hundred feet a minute. Coming back up to 2,000 again. See the altimeter coming back. I wanted you to see how it's possible for us 
to fly these airplanes. Now we'll level it off there as we approach 2,000, you see. Now those are the instruments we're watching when we're flying in, in bad weather and can't see outside, no reference point. This is all we need to, to do it with. The horizon, the rate of climb, the altimeter, the airspeed. And that's the way it's done in the air. Well, now that you know what all these instruments are for, suppose you take a position right behind Mr. McBride here, our engineer, Captain Moss in the co-pilot seat, and uh, follow us through on a takeoff. Uh, let's assume that we're parked now at the takeoff end of runway 31. Shows up here on the RMI. I've got the parking brake set. We're sitting here waiting for permission from the tower to take off. Uh, one thing before we start. When this airplane is rolling down the runway at 103 miles an hour, uh, Mr. Captain Moss will say V1. He'll sing out V1. Anytime up to that time, if we should have an engine failure, or I didn't like the looks of things, I can stop. I can pull these into reverse and step on the brakes and stop. After we've reached V1, any time after that, we are committed to the takeoff. Even if we lose an engine, we go right on out just the same because we're now moving so fast and there's so little runway left that we couldn't stop. So we go on right out with it. And there's no problem to it at all. And when we get to B2, when he hollers B2, that's when the airplane at its present configuration and weight and weather conditions should be ready to fly. And at that time, I just come back on the control column and she'll take off. So, so you'll know what's happening. Uh, I'll tell him we're ready to go. He tells the tower we're ready to go. Tower gives us clearance. And we have that little checklist left. He'll ask me to check two or three things. We'll be sure we're ready. And we're cleared to go. I'll start with the throttles, get up about 60 knots, and steer it with this nose wheel until I reach there. Then I'll turn it over to Mr. McBride, and he'll handle the throttles, and I'll guide it down the runway and pull it off and start flying it out while Captain Moss and the engineer do all the other things that are necessary. And I don't think there'd be very much need for me to talk to you after we start going because it'll all be obvious, I think. You keep your eye on the instruments and these lads here, and you'll see what goes on as we're ready. Okay, Captain? No. All righty, tell them we're ready to go. I don't want to tell this is Clipper 700 Peter Abel in position and ready for takeoff. All right, 700 Peter Abel, we'll check the wind to northwest 15 and cleared for immediate takeoff. Over. Clipper 700 Peter Abel. All right, we're cleared for takeoff. We have a checklist. Controls? We can check the controls and make sure they're clear. Okay, they're all Pito clear. Heaters. Pito heaters. Pito on. And cow flaps closed. Powell flaps, he's closing. I'm ready to go. Ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. I release the brakes, and I'll start it rolling and guide it with the nose wheel. All right, back takeoff power. Takeoff power. about a thousand feet a minute. 
We got 180 knots indicated there, 180 miles an hour. This is a, no, this is a knot, 180 knots. And we're really going upstairs, about 1,500 feet a minute now. And about this time, the captain and the engineer run through their takeoff list. Uh, they have to take off, please. Water feathering, off, fuel boat, low, buffet power, on, cabin pressurization, it's okay. Wing flaps are up, gear handle, neutral, hydraulic bypass, up, landing lights, up, up and off. off. Seatbelt no smoking. Off, that's it. There you go. That's how the team sitting up in the cockpit is working and going through their procedures while you sit back in the big comfortable seats of these airliners and relax and enjoy yourself. Completely free of any fear, any worries of any kind. You don't need it. Now, that's what the crew is doing up in the cockpit. You heard a voice in there. The voice you heard was the airway's traffic controller. And what I propose to do tonight before we get through is let you see what kind of gentleman that is. That traffic, that airway's traffic controller. What he's doing and how much we depend on him. And I'm able to do this tonight through the grand courtesy of our sponsor who is uh, Bristol Myers who make several things. Bufferin is one of them, which is the finest deodorant there is on the market today, the number one seller in America. Uh, easy to see why it is. <laughs> I see some of the others are trying to steal this idea. Now it's so good. They want to put it up in the same kind of bottle. Well, they're going to have a little trouble because they can, they can put it up in the same kind of bottle all except the way in which they hold this marble in here. That's going to be rough because that's a patented process. You won't have any trouble with this band. This is the leader. This is the one that thought about it in the first place. You just roll it on, see? Roll it on. That's all you need. And you need never worry all day long about your personal social standing among your most intimate friends. And, of course, the other product they make is Bufferin. One of the other products. They make Ipana. They make Vitalis for your hair. They got all kinds of things. Bufferin is the uh, other one I want to mention tonight to you. Bufferin being the modern way to take aspirin. One doesn't ask for aspirin anymore. You say, give me a couple of Bufferin. Buy a bottle of Bufferin. Keep it in your uh, medicine cabinet. Use it when you get a headache, neuralgia pain. Fix your pain for you like that. Remember the two products now? Ban... Buffer it, made by Bristol Myers, and they are the tops. Incidentally, the leading <laughs> sellers in their lines. Bufferin is the number one, and uh, Ban is the number one. Now, as we go on tonight, and I hope you'll stay with me because I've got some very interesting things to show you. I want you to meet these airways traffic controlmen, the communicators, and the radar men and the engineers and see what their problems are as this airways traffic of ours grows and grows and grows. The men who handle not only airline traffic, airline airplanes, but private airplanes, executive airplanes, and military airplanes. They handle all the traffic in the skies in the United States today. And uh, they're a dedicated, wonderful bunch of people about which you'll hear as we go on to the second half.